Hello to everyone, another EasyChem chat uh, today with my friend Andrea Rossetti. Andrea is a neurologist uh, at the University of Lausanne in Switzerland. Hi, Andrea. Hi, uh, well. hi Fabio. Uh, thanks for participating to our chat. Uh, Andrea, as I said, is a neurologist and uh, uh, among uh, different topics has a particular uh, experience uh, in the field of EEG, which is the topic today, electroencephalography monitoring, in critically patients. So the first question, which is for you probably the easiest one, is that um, we consider the role of EG in the ICU patients to basically detect seizure or status epilepticus. So the question is, which is the patients we should monitor and how long should we monitor for this indication? So maybe I would nuance uh, your question, if you allow, uh, uh, Fabio, uh, which is the patient that we, we would record and uh, then monitor for how long. Uh, uh, how long. So uh, I would uh, record very liberally patients in the ICU that have uh, 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 disorders of consciousness that are not explained. So I, I, I tell my younger colleagues, if you think of an EEG, then do it. Don't, don't try to you know, refrain from recording it. As we all know, the proportion of uh, patients seizing in the ICU uh, is quite considerable, uh, depending on, on uh, uh, etiologies. It oscillates between five and maybe 20, 30%. So it's, uh, it's uh, relevant. On the other side, the vast majority of seizures are uh, non-convulsive. So without EEG, no chance of detecting them. Then the length of the recording should be tailored to the patient and the clinical situation. There are uh, recent literature uh, uh, inputs that are very knowledgeable and uh, validated that uh, inform on the um, presence of variables that can uh, determine the length, uh, the optimal length of, of an EEG. Uh, I'm talking about risk factors, you know, features of the EEG that uh, may uh, pretend or not a risk of uh, subsequent seizures. So once again, be liberal to start the recording and then adapt uh, uh, the length uh, to the clinical situation. I like your response of individualized monitoring because, you know, when it started, I think it was 15, 16 years ago with the first paper with Jan class and the concept was monitor at least 14 hours with continuous CG. Now, my question for you, maybe you can also introduce the study you were the PI about, you know, continuous versus intermittent, um, which is the, the role of having a continuous monitoring versus an intermittent monitoring and how you individualize the choice for ICU patients? You know, uh, you, you can maybe take a step aside, go outside the ICU and take a patient with uh, 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 hyper arterial hypertension. Of course, you can have an ambulatory continuous measure of the of the arterial pressure of the blood pressure, and that's the optimum. But for practical purposes, I would say the vast majority of pay, of patients would uh, benefit of having two or three measures per day, and you can manage, you know, ninety five percent or ninety eight percent of ambulatory patients like that. And probably the the same is true. Uh, with different percentages for ICU patients. In other word, uh, words, um, if you have an unlimited access to continuous EG monitoring, and if you say monitoring, you should have somebody looking continuously at the EG. And that's, that's the tricky part, because uh, if not, it's just continuous recording, uh, by the way. So if you have an unlimited access to that, fair, you can do more, and then you will have more information. However, the vast majority of centers, especially in your, maybe apart from your center, uh, uh, Fabio, have limited resources in having machines uh, uh, of, of EG recording. And, and then once again, you should tailor uh, the, uh, the approach to the patient. Uh, you alluded to the study that addressed the key question whether the length of the EG is related per se to the outcome, and it, it, it turned out to be negative. Of course, there are problems as with uh, any randomized controlled trial, but that reminds us of uh, something very important. So if you see seizure, it doesn't mean automatically that these seizures are uh, contributed independently to the prognosis of the patient. They could be in some, in many, I, we don't know, patients, uh, just an epiphenomenon of a massive brain damage. And therefore, uh, what's uh, maybe 
a, a pragmatic approach is to have repeated EG at least and to turn into uh, continuous EG if you see, for example, seizures or status, because then you should monitor continuously the effect of the treatment. If not, once again, you can adjust your length uh, using uh, variables that are predictable uh, or predictive of the risk of subsequent seizures and then have a patient-tailored approach. You, uh, of course, we started from seizure and I think uh, that there was very clear your responses. Now the question is, in some, for example, non-anoxic brain injury, EEG is also used for other purposes. It's not only for a, a detected seizure. Which would be that those indications? Maybe they're not entirely clear for uh, the mean ICU audience. So we have uh, maybe a, a very broad indication to assess the degree of, of encephalopathy, of brain dysfunction, uh, with the speed of the background activity that is informative, the presence of uh, physiological features of sleep, for example, that uh, uh, pertains a better outcome, recent literature, um, or the presence of uh, uh, a reactivity to a stimuli uh, that also has a favorable outcome uh, relationship. More recently, there has been literature, especially from North America, regarding uh, uh, the survey of the EG to detect pre uh, very promptly uh, delayed ischemia in subarachnoid uh, hemorrhage patients. That, uh, as far as I understand, is not as uh, broadly used now as the other indication, but it's a very promising one that has to be maybe better studied uh, in a relationship with the um, uh, ultrasound, for example, that is uh, more routinely used. You mentioned prognosis, and uh, maybe we have to say that, uh, especially with the new guidelines uh, in cardiac arrest patients, the role of EG has been really put at the top of the prognostic factors, uh, which would be the more relevant findings we're looking at, especially for poor outcome. So thanks for this question. Maybe uh, just making a, another step aside, if you allow, uh, in this indication, in post-cardiac arrest patients, the EEG is mandatory. In other, all other indications, you know, it's recommended if you don't understand what happens with the consciousness disorders of the patient. So um, the idea here is to have repeated examination or a continuous examination of the patient in, optimal, uh, in an optimal setting, but once again, I think repeated examination are perfectly sound um, to understand the evolution of the brain activity of the patient. And then you have poor outcome features that have been studied for decades, uh, such as you know, the absence uh, of a continuous background, um, the presence of epilep repetitive epileptiform features or discharges, and uh, maybe the reactivity lack, so the, 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 the lack of, of a variability to external stimuli. More recently, there has been uh, attention detected towards good outcome predictors. Uh, this is uh, a precocious uh, reappearance of a continuous background, especially if it's reactive. And... Uh, uh, the presence of uh, physiological features of, of sleep that you can actively look for. And uh, uh, in other words, the EEG informs in a dynamic way because you repeat it or you look at it, uh, you know, over the first couple of days uh, on both poor and good prognosis. And as you said, it's a key player in the multimodal algorithm uh, for prognostication. In many ICU, you know, they, they, which are you know, mixed ICU like yours and, and mine, we have a lot of patients who are not supposed to have a brain injury, at least not the primary one, but still there is a role of EG on some of those. Uh, do you think it's just a matter of uh, sedation monitoring or it might also maybe indicate early something going on in these patients? Like, you know, well, ECMO, sepsis, you know? This is especially true nowadays uh, for the with fifth wave uh, of this uh, nice virus that we are experiencing since uh, early 2020. So we have primarily non-brain injured patients that uh, are in the ICU and often they lie down uh, unconscious for a longer time as, uh, as we, we, we may uh, uh, expect. And therefore, once again, the EEG can be informative on the degree of sedation maybe, but you know, reduced montage or, a, 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 you know, a, a, a compressed EEG can be very informative also if you want to have, or by spectral index, for instance, if you want to have information on this side. 
Uh, on the other side, you can quantify the degree of encephalopathy. We just had one EEG early this morning in a COVID patient that uh, has a challenging uh, uh, awakening after uh, uh, winning of sedation, and we found an encephalopathy, which is reactive. Okay, we told the, the team, wait and see. So nothing uh, catastrophical. And maybe in a couple of percent of patients, maybe up to 5%, you can find seizures at times. That's quite rare as compared to other conditions, but of course, if you miss those, uh, it can be challenging for the patients. I have a last question, which is, I think is the more challenging for you. Uh, when I'm in the room of a patient with all this neuromonitoring, most of those can be directly interpreted by the neurointensivist or the intensivist. We have an oxygen value, an ICP value. Uh, even if you have macrodiasis, at least you have a number you can look at. The EG, now remember, most of cases is in the corner of a room and no one looks at and we ask a neurologist, neurophysiologist to tell us what's going on there because we have not ever a clue. So my question is, do you think that we are, it's in totally impossible or there are solutions in the future where a neurointensivist can at least look at main EG fundings and use this really as a, a continuous monitoring at two o'clock in the morning, three o'clock in the morning, maybe call the neurophysiologist to have a specific look and a pattern, but can trained people be able in the future to, let's say, gain the minimum information from this monitoring? Yes, definitely. It's a very important question, Fabio. Uh, once again, if we think uh, a little bit uh, outside of the EG field, um, the average neuro in or intensivist or general intensivist is not a cardiologist, rhythmologist, but she or he can readily interpret the EKG. And uh, why shouldn't be this true for a, for a basic EEG? Of course, um, I think nowadays we are using increasingly uh, compressed uh, EEG and uh, having a regular expo exposure to that with somebody who can explain you know, the main features is, is very informative. And therefore, I'm, I'm pretty much convinced that uh, an interested neurointensivist uh, neuro or general intensivist can have a, a, um, reasonable uh, knowledge uh, to interpret overnight, for example, or on weekends, the, the direction of the EG. There are specific features, like, for example, I don't know, I'm, I'm not an EKG specialist, but uh, diagnosing a Brugada syndrome or a, you know, re-entry, a complex re-entry, Wolf Parkinson White, maybe is, is more for the specialist of the cardiology department. So you don't do that, you know, with your residents. Okay, there, are, there will be always specific features that are uh, 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 better, maybe uh, uh, in, identified by the neurophysiologist. But once again, the broad dynamic of the EG is extremely accessible to anybody, provided that this anybody is interested. Of course, I, I think you agree, Fabio, if you look at an EG twice a year, no chance to be trained. No. If you look at it quick, uh, uh, weekly, and maybe quickly, then you can have some, uh, some, uh, some confidence in doing that. And once again, so you do interplay with, uh, with your counterpart on the neurophysiology department is key. With these words full of hope, which means that in a few months, maybe years, uh, we will discuss again uh, what the neurointensivist is able to interpret in EG. Thanks a lot, Andrea, for this very thoughtful information about EG, hoping that uh, this will uh, open the interest for many intensivists to this very interesting monitoring in the ICU. Thanks a lot and see you next time. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Fabio.